This content is brought to you by Link2, which makes private equity investment easy. I've been a user of Link2 for years. They allow you to access many different tech companies and crypto companies pre-IPO. They have over 166,000 members. They have over $234 million in total investments. And some of the companies in their portfolio includes Ripple, Uphold, Circle, Dapper Labs, Ledger, BitPay, and many more. Link2 is one of the reputable companies out there working with some very big names. And if you'd like to learn more, please visit the link in the description. Welcome back to the Thinking Crypto Podcast, your home for cryptocurrency news and interviews. With me today is Stefan Thomas, who's no stranger to the show. Stefan is, of course, the co-creator of the Interledger Protocol. Stefan, it's great to have you back on. Great to be back on. Um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't do a lot of interviews at the moment, but when you called, I have to say yes. So. Oh, I'm so thankful to have you on. And, you know, last time we spoke was two years ago. I know you're always heads down working on cool things. Um, and maybe we can start with Dossie. You know, tell us about this new venture and, and you know, what you're doing there and, and what you have in mind. Yeah, absolutely. So um, Dossie is a new open source project that I started working on. And in some ways for me, it feels like a little bit like going back to my roots, like before I got involved with Ripple and, and Coil and, and, you know, being more entrepreneurial and running teams and all that kind of stuff. Um, I, I was just an open source developer working on Bitcoin stuff back in 2010, 2011. And, um, I really missed that feeling of like not having to worry about meetings and capital and money and all these other things that come along with like being in a, you know, high octane funded company. Um, and so I decided that I wanted to just go back to just working on code because you can have a lot of impact with that. And I think my own talents are very much in like the technical realm, not so much in the interpersonal realm. <laughs> And sure. so, um, yeah, it's been it's been really fun to work on a new project. And so, um, Dasi is uh, basically a peer to peer implementation of Interledger. So, um, for those who don't know Interledger, Interledger is a way to route money in in the form of little packets. So, if you think of the internet routing packets of data, Interledger routes packets of money. And then Dasi is a peer to peer implementation of Interledger. So it's just a peer to peer network. Um, you'll be able to download the Dasi client, just like you can download Bitcoin D or any other uh, crypto ledger client, and then connect to the network and it'll talk to other nodes in the network. And there's no other onboarding or anything like that. Um, the initial version will use crypto to settle. In principle, you could use anything, but um, initial version will use crypto. And that's pretty much what I'm working on. And it, right now it's just a labor of love. I don't know if anyone will care when it comes out and I don't really care if they do or not, but I'm, I'm having a lot of fun building it. Oh, that's awesome. And so it sounds like, like you were saying, it's open source. You're kind of doing this on your own. Uh, do you envision at a later point, it may uh, branch into some uh, official company or tool set? Uh, or maybe get adopted by some third party who was looking to integrate the interledger? Um, I think I kind of look at it the way you would look at like the original version of Bitcoin or something like that. It's like the intention is to put something out there and then see what people do with it. And, you know, if people do nothing with it, then that's also a great signal to take back and like maybe work on something else. But um, I don't have any plans to turn this into a company or anything like that. If, if anything, I'm sort of happy to be back to pure coding and not having to think about all the things that come along with the company. Like, um, so right now it's just a fun project and I think it's really, really interesting technology. It's, it, you know, I've wanted to make Interledger more accessible for a long time. And so I'm finally getting to fulfill that dream. So yeah, hoping that people will enjoy playing around with it. So Stefan, if you don't mind me asking and, and. It you you can say no, you don't want to answer this, but given that this is not anything related to some major funding or company or, or so forth, how how are you paying your bills? And that's a genuine curiosity because as someone you know who has the podcast on the side, I have full time job. You know, how are you living, so to speak? You know, given that you're not with Coil anymore and things like that. Yeah. Uh, well, you know. It is always an awkward topic, but I I did buy some Bitcoin back in uh, 2010, and that is now allowing me to to be pretty financially independent. And so, yeah, 
that's that's how I'm funding it for now. Yeah, got it, got it. Okay, say no more. Um, but it sounds like you're going back to like you were saying your coding roots and and that kind of feeds your soul and makes you happy versus like trying to run a company and things like that. Um, tell us about Coil and and the reason behind sunsetting that project. Yeah, I mean, Coil um, has been an incredible experience, and I. I can't believe the team that was interested in coming to work for me and with me. Um, and so it's been an incredible ride and very sad thing to shut down. Um, it did a lot of amazing stuff. Like one of the things that Coil did is um, prove out Interledger, like in a real commercial setting, like we were able to process tens of billions of packets um, while, while we were um, operational. Uh, we also demonstrated web monetization can work. And, you know, there were a lot of interesting, you know, projects built around it, like Cinnamon, a video-based platform that was using web monetization and like various blogging platforms. And we got um, a lot of traction in the sort of developer publishing community with uh, sites like Hacker Noon, Dev2, and so on. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of amazing stuff there. But at the end of the day, like we got a lot of uh, funding from Ripple. And so for Coil to be a real success, we would have had to become like a billion dollar company. Um, and, you know, one of the things I realized was that, you know, the best success that we had was in the early days of Coil when we were very grassroots focused and we had a peer to peer network and so on. Um, and the more time was passing that I felt like the further we were uh getting away from it that um and so i what i ended up deciding is you know we the most of the money we hadn't spent yet um and so i sort of just gave that back to ripple and i said you know we'll we'll just take the wins that we had like setting up the intellectual foundation the funding that that's received that has been fantastic for the intellectual community that's going to set up uh intellectual for many years to come um, we did a lot of good work in open source. We did a lot of good work for the XRP community. We did some uh, interesting spin-off companies, like companies like Tiger Beetle, Fame Boss, and others. Um, uh, too many to list, frankly. Um, so there's been a lot of great stuff, um, and it seemed like the right moment to um, to scale back and and say like, okay, we we don't want to keep spending money on a huge team if we don't have a clear idea of how we're going to make that money back, frankly. And so um that was a tough decision uh i think it was the right decision um and yeah i i'm just glad that we were able to do it the right way like uh, you know everyone on the team hopefully is is taken care of um and uh, we all i think look back fondly about the time at coil and that's sort of the best you can say about a company that doesn't become the billion dollar thing you were shooting for so um but uh, yeah, I think also on a more personal level, like I sort of, you know, realized that running a company, it's it's fantastic. And I have a ton of respect for the people that do it. But, um, you know, it's also a very high pressure thing. And so we've been we've been doing coil for um, five years. And so it was sort of time to move on and yeah, do something else. And then for me personally, it's just been a huge relief to go back to just more technical work where I think my talents are sort of more, more there. So, Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. And, but I think the idea of Quill, I mean, do you think you guys were too early that, you know, the technology absolutely makes sense. And I can see this absolutely being the future with uh publisher and advertiser models, uh, you know, kind of diminishing and, with everything running on the blockchain, micro payments and, and that model being, you know, the standard, do you think there could be a resurgence of coil sometime in the future or some another company doing something similar to what you guys were doing? Yeah. Um, well, there are I think a couple of things where we might have been too early and a couple of things where there might there there are more like learnings, like things I would do differently if we started over. Um in the too early vein, I think one of the biggest problems that's inherent with micropayments is uh, authorizing the payments. So, you know, with a regular payment, you can click a button and say like, hey, I would like to pay this person. Um, but that becomes quite 
annoying when you're talking about micropayments and especially when you're talking about the kind of payments that we were making a coil like less than a cent you know mm -hmm. um and so i think things like ai will make it easier to automate stuff like that like at coil we use the sort of proxy of you know if you're spending more time on a website then we think you're getting more value out of it because otherwise why you're still there um but interestingly that that actually doesn't fit perfectly like for example we were working with some search engines and they were telling us like hey actually our product is doing the best job when people spend the least amount of type time on it you know like you want mm -hmm. to find the thing you're looking for as fast as possible and so the model wasn't like perfect we were playing around with different stuff like paying per query and things like that um but at the end of the day you want something that's like flexible enough um to truly represent the user's sort of intent like um and it's very hard to make that into an algorithm because whatever rules you come up with, websites will just game it. They'll just game the system and try to maximize the revenue. So you need something that's like fairly smart. And so maybe AI can help with that. Um, and then some of the things that we learned. So um, definitely that part I mentioned about the peer-to-peer -peer grassroots. Um, when you try to build a system where um you go into it with you know a lot of capital and you're trying to put together like a coalition um that's a very powerful approach that can work really well um but it can also fail because you have sort of a fixed window of time where you can you know sort of a fixed runway and then if you run out of money it doesn't doesn't happen and with something like Interledger, where it's like very it's a very long-term project very ambitious project there are a lot of things you don't know and you don't control. So like, for example, you know, when are certain preconditions in the marketplace going to happen, like AI emerging or whatever else is needed, I don't know when that's going to happen. And so if I spend all my money now to try to put together like a bunch of wallets and a bunch of content providers and a bunch of other people, and I try to bring them all into the ecosystem, but the timing is wrong by like two years, then by the time the timing is right, they've all already given up on it and turned off their support and you know walked away from it because they're not earning money with it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's sort of you know like I, you know I wasn't involved in that project, but like what maybe what happened with Quibi or you see a lot of these like big well-funded projects and they sort of fire all their ammunition and they either make it or they don't. And that's sort of one approach, but the approach that I experience being early in Bitcoin was a very different one. And I think it's a much, you know, you have to have more patience, but it's also a much more stable, sustainable one, which is um, just kind of building it and it's just going to exist. There's nobody who's, you know, running out of money and then it, the Bitcoin network will turn off or anything like that. So it can just sort of sit there um, until somebody finds it interesting and jumps on it. And um, part of working on Dossi is trying to get Interledger more in that state where rather than trying to spend a lot of capital to try to bring people in, we just build it. And if anyone comes, great. If anyone doesn't come, also fine. <laughs> That's kind of thing. Like, so like just like field of dreams, build it and they'll come, right? <laughs> yeah. And I, I I think it's um you know, if if that's your your pitch to me as an investor, then I'm obviously skeptical. But if it's like your hobby project, I think build it and they'll come is a great approach because if they don't come, you've lost a hobby project and start a new hobby project, you know, like you don't not lost anything. But if you take if you raise a lot of money um, and and then people don't find it interesting, that is a problem because you have to, you know, um, your investors are going to be mad at you. So um, I think it was uh, it was a lot of things learned um, from that experience. And I think that um with the most ambitious projects ironically the less resources you put into them the better chance they have um yeah so let's say two years from now stefan uh ai is much better where maybe ai version 2.0 i don't know <laughs> what, what iteration will be at but you can integrate it with web payments and and um a lot of website metrics and protocols and controls are ai driven or controlled could are you keeping coil in your back pocket that you may come back may, may it may not be called coil but something similar and you can enhance the business model so to speak with ai yeah um i mean there's some money that we made at coil um for example like imager got acquired and so we earned some money from that um and so 
you know, there's also other companies that we invested in, some of which might be successes. So there might be some money coming back. So if if that happens and there's an opportunity that I feel very strongly about, there's definitely the potential to bring Coil back because um, I still feel an obligation to the investors, to the shareholders to try to maximize their value and try to give them something that they can look back at as a huge success. I think right now, you know, based on all the equity investors, if we dissolve Coil today, everyone would sort of get back roughly what they put in, uh, which is not a great story, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, um, yeah, I, I would definitely be open to that, but it would have to be the right opportunity. And like the mistake I don't want to repeat is, you know, kind of venturing into the unknown. Like, you know, with Coil, when we launched, there was no Interledger network, there was no Interledger market. Um, and so part of what I want to do with Dossi is like give those things a chance to develop and then jump back in with a commercial venture project when there's actually a vibrant ecosystem there um, that that has an established need already that we can fulfill. Mm. Um, and for 2023, obviously you're working on Dossi. Um, are you doing anything else with the Interledger? Um, is there anything else that is on your roadmap that you maybe you're planning to get involved with, uh, if you could share any of that. Yeah, so the Intellectual Foundation, which I'm the chairperson of the on the board, um, it, we are still very active, giving grants to people, doing stuff with Intellectual, building that community, also building relationships with you know public uh, entities, governments, academic institutions, etc. Um, because a project of that type, you need researchers trying to break it and poke holes in it and you know people trying to think about um you know starting ventures and and countries thinking about how it's going to fit their regulatory framework and so on and so you still need all of that going on um and so the intelligent foundation is 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 growing and they're doing a lot of great stuff in that vein um the main touch point this year will be uh, the summit. So the Intelligent Foundation hosts an annual summit. This time it'll be in Costa Rica at the end of the year. So uh, if people want to check that out, it's just intelligent.org. And um, yeah, if you look for the summit, I'm sure you'll find it on there. Um, and that's always, you know, my favorite, you know, week of the year is like when I get to go to Intelligent Summit and hang out with other people who are into the project. So, yeah. Um. And is there anything happening in the crypto industry outside of what you're working on that piques your interest and you're like, hmm, that that seems interesting, whether it be NFTs, DeFi, uh, or whatever it may be? Um, That's a good question. I mean, there's definitely, so right now I'd say outside of Dossier, a lot of my focus is more on AI technologies and trying to keep up with what's going on in that space. Mm-hmm. Um you know, maybe for context, like before I got into crypto, I had a, I had spent a lot of time working on AI, but back then it was kind of too early, right? Like mm. the capabilities were sort of very minimal. I ended up building like a programming language. So it was a stack based programming language that I thought would be useful for like AI to write programs in and things like that. But it was all very early and I couldn't really do much. And, and so, you know, crypto was like a very welcome thing to jump into. Um, but now that the capabilities are getting there, that you can do very interesting things with it. I am, it's sucking up a lot of my, my attention. Um, I still think that, um, you know, smart contracts are a really, really interesting topic. Um, I, you know, I've, I've talked about this in, in past interviews, but like, I still think the architecture of running code within a distributed ledger or on a blockchain is not a good way of doing it. I think that you should separate the two, just like we do with the traditional three tier architecture. You have your database and that's just, you know, pretty simple business logic is who has access to modify the data and that's it. Um, and I think that's where your blockchain should be. Um, and then you can have other systems that are stateless and they can talk to multiple blockchains and that's where your business logic is. And so. Anything that pursues that approach, I'm much more more interested in. Um, and I also think, you know, obviously my own projects always play a role, right? So Interledger, I think, would be a really good way to to connect these different things together. So um, part of the reason we developed Interledger in the first place was we were trying to build a smart contracts platform that did that. And then we ran to the problem of like, how do you actually pay the the hosts, the, the, the contract executing hosts? Um, 
And Intelligent was sort of our answer to that. And so um, I, I still think there's this whole puzzle, you know, with all the pieces sort of envisioned, but not yet built. And I, I want to bring that together. Um, there's a, um, what's it called? Uh, I think it's called Helium. That's a project that I've, I'm quite interested in sort of using uh, crypto or micropayments for network access, something that I'm, I've am i always been interested in. Once again, I think, you know, it would be um, nice if you could do something like Intelligis, you wouldn't have to worry about blockchain scalability issues um, and so on. But um, from a perspective of like, you know, having the uh, economics of a, of a blockchain makes a lot of sense in that context. So I thought that was an interesting project. Um, one project everyone loves to hate on, uh, Worldcoin <laughs> of Sam Altman fame. Um, yeah. I, I think that project, it's not so much that like I'm a, I'm a fan of it. It's more that um, I think they, they're, they're, they raise some interesting questions. Um, one of the, the questions is about identity because so much of our world right now is built around this concept of a human who has an identity and they have a vote. And they have, you know, potentially in the future, a UBI is universal basic income. And, you know, it's sort of all based around like the physical individual, you know. And um, if you're imagining like a world where you have AI be increasingly autonomous and, you know, um, you know, I, I sort of think that you can for a while say AI is a tool that humans use, but I don't think that view gets you too far because there's going to be value in giving AI increasing autonomy. And at some point, that connection to the back to some human is going to be pretty tenuous. And so at that point, you have to ask about like, what's AI politics look like? What's AI society look like? You know, yeah. um, and when I think about that, it's sort of interesting because in human society, we have democracy as famously like the best system, except for uh, the worst system, except for all the other ones kind of thing, you know, um, and so, but democracy doesn't really translate over when you can't have a clear unit of an individual, you know, so one person, one vote. If you have something like AI, you could have an AI that runs on a Jetson and you have an AI that runs on a gigantic cluster. Do they each get one vote? Do they get proportional votes based on how many teraflops they have? Like nothing yeah. you can come up with really is very compelling. And so... When I look at Worldcoin, I think the interesting question that I ask myself is like, what's like they're trying to solve this problem of identity, but what's a more fundamental description of that? You know, like if you couldn't give votes based on an individual person, um, well, what what's the deeper thing you could give it based on? You know, right. something that would be inclusive of AI in the future. So. These are again very philosophical things, but those are the sort of things that I think about when I'm not coding. So um, yeah, I, I hope you don't regret asking. <laughs> no, no, the, I I love it because I've also thought about these things and I've often talked about them on my podcast. And that is, uh, in the world of blockchain and the token economy that we're headed to, um, our identity and our data will be on the blockchain, and maybe there is a marketplace in the future where. I can sell that data to certain brands versus how it is right now in cookies and collecting your data. I know there's been GD GDPR and privacy issues, but in the future, maybe our data is tokenized, so to speak. And I can, via maybe a smart contract, lend that out to advertisers or whoever and monetize it. Mm -hmm. And and then to your point of voting, uh, I know many states in the United States, at least, and possibly other countries are looking at uh, blockchain voting to have more fair and efficient voting in in uh, presidential elections and whatever else elections. Um, so I feel like there, there there's a convergence of all these themes, um, but I feel mm -hmm. like blockchain solves a lot of it, maybe to retaining my privacy, my data, and also voting. Uh, what are your thoughts on all that? Yeah, uh, you mentioned a, a use case that I want to like dive into it a little bit, which is the sort of monetizing my data kind of thing. And like, obviously, you know, as Coil, we were in a very adjacent space, which is like, you know, we were paying out from users to websites, mm. but the business model we were competing with was websites making money from ads. And so 
you know, other projects were in the same space. Um, and so we paid a lot of attention to them, things like Bray, for example, where, you know, you have users getting rewarded for watching ads and then they spend that on websites. So it's like they have sort of both sides of that, whereas we only had the payout side. Um, I would say that, you know, kind of going back to the previous more philosophical point about identity, you know, that is a big problem in that area, because whenever you're giving people a way to earn money online by watching ads, for example, you're going to get a lot of bots and, you know, fraud and things like that. And you can look at that and say, oh, we just need a better capture. Or we need a better proof of human looking at the screen or whatever, you know, like maybe soon we'll have like little world coin style orbs making sure we're watching the ads, you know, uh, hopefully not. But, you know, I don't think that's a good approach, though, because ultimately what you're trying to prove isn't that there's a human watching but what you're ultimately interested in if you're selling something and you're advertising is whether people are actually buying the thing you're selling right and so you can skip a few steps and just connect it back to that i think that's a more promising approach and you know another example of like skipping identity to go straight to what you're actually interested in would be the way XRP Ledger approaches consensus is also not so much based on identity, but like you're basically saying, I want to be in consensus with certain people. I don't know who they are. I don't know if they're trustworthy. I just want to be in consensus with this group. And then the algorithm can work off of that. And so uh, I think in our last conversation, we went into a little more detail on, on how that works. But that's another example of like, you're not trying to prove that these companies are who they say they are or they're, they're XYZ company. You're just saying that like, hey, I want to be on the same ledger as whoever, whatever ledger those nodes are on. Um, and that turns out to be all you need. And so, you know, I don't know what the equivalent is for democracy and voting, but maybe it's like, you know, um, some description of, you know, what is society? And then basically saying like, I want the people that make up society, however you define it, to be the ones voting proportionally to how much they make up society. So maybe artists get a vote based on how much art they produce, you know, things like that. Um, I don't know. But, you know, skipping past just saying like, oh, you know, we use human identity as this like shortcut, I think opens up a lot of interesting possibilities and a lot of new ways of looking at problems. What do you think? And I think it's also... Oh, sorry. I think it's also a losing proposition to try to to prove that something is human. It's just like, mm. first of all, it's not inclusive because like every time you say like, oh, we're going to do it based on iris scan. Like, what if I don't have an iris or like, you know, I, I just think that it's you're trying to prove something that is not fundamental, right? Like you're trying to prove something somewhat artificial. And that's why you're always going to have this like arms race and doesn't mean that you can't get something working. Sometimes an okay solution is good enough, but I, I find it much more interesting to, to try to go one level deeper and saying like, what is the fundamental thing behind the human identity that you're trying to get at? For sure. And, you know, as you were saying that with the iris scan, I thought of Minority Report where Tom Cruise gets someone else's eyeballs to, to, uh, yeah, to access, exactly. right? <laughs> it's like, well, it just yeah, opens was, up all these is, things. The, I think this is like a story that someone told me when I was traveling in China was that, um, and I don't know all the details, so I'm probably going to get some details wrong, but it was something like they imposed, the government imposed some limits on like how many stocks people could buy. And so, you know, there were people, billionaires, whatever, they wanted to trade much higher than what the limit was. And so they would send people out into the rural countryside to just co to buy ID cards off of people so they could make brokerage accounts and then buy larger amounts of stocks. And wow. so literally people would come back with like a backpack full of ID cards that they bought for like 20 bucks a pop or something, you know? So um, I don't know. It's just like whenever you try to tie things to an identity, you're just creating a situation that incentivizes people to game whatever mechanism you, you came up with, you know? And I think that it makes more sense to try to get go one level deeper. Anyway, I, I think I've explained that point enough. Yeah, yeah, no, great thoughts. Um, I love it. And because I've been thinking about these things as well, I've been, been talking a bit about them on, on the podcast. Um, what do you also think about this? And I've been talking about this. Uh, blockchain is a solution to help curb AI deepfakes with, with photos, videos, any types of media, because we're seeing the rise of that. And sometimes it's, I think for now, you know, most folks can tell the difference, but it could get so sophisticated 
that you can. And blockchain could be the way that you know if an image or a video comes from a certain source, it's on the blockchain, verifiable. What do you think about that? Yeah. Um, well, there there have been a lot of um, projects around like using blockchain to show provenance of content and things like that. And um, you know, with Coil being in the content space, that was adjacent. So we did have a lot of conversations around that topic. There's a couple of points I, I would make there. One is um, it's really just part of the blockchain feature set that you need there, which is like the I, the, the fact that it's um, you've signed something and timestamped something. Um, so, you know, you can come up with something that's like a stripped down blockchain that does the same thing. So that's more of a technical point. So you don't need like a full blown blockchain to do this. And in fact, when you try to put something like content on a blockchain where you know, in a blockchain, you're trying to maintain the ledger state forever. And so if that grows very quickly as people are trying to put, you know, every image that they upload to social media on it, you very quickly run into scalability issues. But what you could do is you could simply like, you know, timestamp the content and prove like, oh, I published this content before you did. Um, I actually have a, an anecdote around timestamping content for, content for copyright reasons. So back in the day, you know, uh, Fabi and I, who's a co-founder of Coil as well, um, but he was more importantly, a longtime friend, uh, one of my childhood friends. Um, and so when I first got into Bitcoin, there was a bounty for making an animated video. And I teamed up with Fabi to make the video. We got it uploaded to YouTube and it went viral. And so it started to appear on all these news broadcasts like CNN and CNBC and all these other ones. Um, and one of the ones that it was shown on was Al Jazeera. And um, they were apparently members of the content ID system on YouTube. And so when their news show was uploaded to YouTube, um, we got taken down. Like our video got taken down because it matched Al Jazeera because they had shown it. Right. Uh, and I was like, how do you not check that the supposed air date of the thing that was uploaded is later than when our video was uploaded when you try to do the content ID match? So that, right. that was so ridiculous to me and of course like when you try to dispute it there's no checkbox for that scenario because google doesn't make mistakes you know <laughs> um the only reason i was able to to get it reinstated was uh with big thanks to my current who was working at google at the time so he, he went to the youtube engineers and and somehow sorted it out but um anyway so that's kind of a little anecdote of like it is not so easy sometimes to you know establish what came first, you know, like, cause even if you have a system where you can timestamp things, it might be someone who ripped you off, who, who goes to that system first, because you just didn't bother as the original author. And so really most of the time it becomes more of a detective game where like, you know, you can't just make a neat system where if everybody was using it, it would be great, but then somebody doesn't use it. And so then it becomes like not authoritative anymore. So it becomes more of an investigative game. Like, oh, this person had the song in 1992 and they posted it on their website but before that the song was on this album you know that was released in this country you know a year before oh but before that somebody had shared it on this file sharing network as a experimental song that they made and so you kind of trace it back and you find earlier and earlier things and i think that having like a more provable timestamp is definitely helpful um it would be interesting to see something like, you know, having your phone sign every picture it takes or something like that. And, and sort of saying like, hey, you know, we've got a reasonably credible signature that this picture was really taken on this phone in this place at this time. Um, obviously, it would have to be optional because it always becomes like a privacy concern. But it would be a nice feature to have to be able to like, so like, hey, there's aside from just analyzing the picture to make sure it's not AI generated or deep faked, et cetera, but there's actually like a bit of a, you know, hardware security around it too. Um, the problem with hardware security is it's never perfect. So it's not going to stop any sophisticated people from making deep fakes, which, you know, sometimes those things can backfire if you make, you know, mechanisms that are strong security, but not perfect security. And then people exploit them. That just makes it more credible of a deep fake because it has all those signatures that it's, that are supposed to be hard to fake. So I don't know. I don't have a really good answer. I, I think blockchain is like a smaller piece in that conversation, but I don't think it's like a panacea or anything. Mm. Uh, are, are you concerned as many are with AI? Obviously a lot of pros, a lot of advantages, but I guess it's almost like the 
just the nature of new technology, right? Uh, some folks exploit it. Sometimes we don't put the guardrails in place ahead of time. It runs amok, and then we have to make the correction. See something like that happening with AI that uh, we may run into some problems a few years from now, and then we have to put rules and guardrails and regulations in place. Well, I, I would say that fakes are already good, at least sophisticated ones. So, you know, most of the time, if, you know, some photograph turns out to be fake or some piece of art turns out to be fake, it's not necessarily that people, you know, looked at it very closely and noticed that it was fake. It's more like things about the provenance story start to raise questions or, you know, like, how did this get here? Or how did this get into your hands and so on? And so um, I don't think that AI fundamentally changes that game. Um, it just, it makes it easier to to make fakes so we will see more fakes. Um, but I also think that um, you can use it to try to detect fakes better. So I, I, don't, I just don't see how it like fundamentally changes what has already been going on for many years with Photoshop and like, you know, going all the way back to the Soviet Union, removing people from photos and stuff like that. Like none of that is new, you know, it's always been going on. And I don't think like AI is going to, you know, topple the world's governments because <laughs> it's suddenly going to make everything untrustworthy. I just don't buy that story. I think it's, I, I grew up with the web. And one of the first things I learned about the web is don't trust anything you read online. <laughs> so like, yeah. I don't see how AI <laughs> changes that fundamentally. For sure. I know. And you brought up a great point because you can also use the AI technology to help police that activity, mm -hmm. almost like police AI looking out for bad AI. I don't know, <laughs> but something yeah, along it, those lines. Yeah, I, I think that's a really interesting point. And, and th there's something pretty profound about that, which is, um, one of the things that's stopping um, us from investigating every fake story that we come across, right? Like you hear something and then you're like, oh, that's interesting. And you don't fact check it because we can't fact check every little thing that we hear, right? Right. Um, and that's kind of constrained rationality, right? Like we only have so much time in our day, so we only can put our brain power towards so many things. But one of the things that AI does is it expands the capacity for rationality because I can myself think about a lot of things, but then I might also have an AI that thinks about more things for me. Um, so for example, it could imagine that there's like an AI that like pays attention to everything that I read and see online and then does things like check it on fact check websites or, you know, look up the sources and make sure they actually say what the thing said that they say and things like that. And like, we'll have a lot more bandwidth to do that um, than before. Again, yeah. I don't know how that all will shake out, like which factors will be more more powerful, because um, again, you can make fakes better for sure. Um, but I, I think that honestly, the bigger problem has not been like detecting fakes, but like it's already been debunked. You just don't know about, it, you know? And so having something or some some agent that can let you know like hey by the way the thing you just read has already been debunked i think is kind of nice and one of one of the things that i also would point to is the way we've been trying to address fake news and things like that so far has been very centralized like oh you have the social media platform has a team of a panel of fact checkers and they tell you what's true and what's not true you know and i think you know I don't think you have to be very fringe to make an argument that um, that's not always doesn't always work out. You know, sometimes the mainstream opinion is just wrong or like sometimes it is worth considering other points of view. Right. Um, and so I actually like the idea of something that's more like everybody has their own AI agent and they do some fact checking for you and like look at different sources rather than having like a committee whether it's the government or a big corporation that just tells everybody what's true and what isn't. Cause I think that there's a lot of danger in that. Yeah, that's a great point. And I was just thinking about an example that took place was this past weekend and the weekend before there was a rumor spreading on Twitter that SEC Gary Genser was going to resign. Now the source of it, I, I found the site and it was just some random blog that didn't have any credibility. It looked like it was just built like a few weeks ago. Unless, unless it was Gary Gensler's blog yeah. that <laughs> cast some immediate doubts right. on the story. But like an AI um, could go and track down the original source of that post, 
um, and see which accounts are tweeting from. Are they verified? Is this site does it have a track record? Was it built last month? And and has any of the credible uh, journalistic sources confirmed this, or has the SEC itself confirmed this? So I feel like data mining, all of that social media activity, and where is this coming from? Right, it started from one place and then it spread like a wildfire. Could to your what exactly what you're saying? Do it faster than a committee. It could do it real time. Okay, who's saying this and what's happening? And and here's the sentiment and things like that. Yeah, it's it's not just about doing it faster though, because like it's not about how fast you can debunk it it's it's how many like who can do it you know because you were able to take the time to really dig into this particular story and find the root information right if i had seen that online i wouldn't have had the time to do that right Mm -hmm. and so enabling more people to do the same thing that you already did um but just enabling more people to do it i think will help um with the spread of that kind of information because or with the spread of misinformation because for it to spread, it needs to fool a lot of people. And it doesn't, the problem is it doesn't matter if some of those people figure out it's misinformation because they look it up because the other people will continue spreading it, you know? And so the more people we can ama- uh, uh, sort of inoculate, we might get herd immunity against misinformation. You know, it's like if if the more people have something that fact checks or have the ability to fact check, um, the, the less you'll see that, that information spread, at least hypothetically. Yeah. Sure. Um, let's talk about uh, some things happening in the crypto market. Uh, recently, you had some very big Wall Street names enter the crypto market, like BlackRock, Fidelity, Charles Schwab, and Citadel launch a crypto exchange, BlackRock filing for a Bitcoin spot ETF. And that kind of opened the floodgates where everybody's lining up now. Um, I know you're more in the building side. You don't necessarily focus too much on that. But Given your, you know, how long you've been in this industry and you saw Bitcoin, you were early adopter of Bitcoin, and you worked at Ripple, um, you know, what's it like to see, you know, the, the dichotomy of where you started to where things are at now? Yeah, I mean, it's the contrast between like when I first got into Bitcoin, there were no exchanges, right? This was before Mt. Gox started. This, you know, the, the you could trade Bitcoin on an IRC channel, and that was it, you know. Um, and and then you go from that to Mt. Gox, where you know, from what I've heard, it, it was a bunch of slapped together PHP scripts, you know, to now Coinbase, which is a publicly traded corporation, to hopefully someday, you know, US New York Stock Exchange listed straight Bitcoin ETFs. I've, like we're very close to sort of the 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 ultimate, right? Like the, we're sort of on the second to last step, and so. I think it's only a matter of time. I can't really imagine that they'll resist it forever. I mean, there's only so many objections you can hold up, but I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know how these processes go. Um, But just from from the outside, like the trend, the long-term trend has always been eventually they say yes. So I don't know if it's going to be this round or next one or five years or 10 years. I don't know. But my my bet and my prediction would be eventually they'll say yes. and like honestly, I don't fault them for being conservative, being cautious. You know, I think there were a lot of times, or you know, there are a lot of times in in the history of crypto where I was watching from my vantage point, and I was like, I wish people would kind of slow down and like mm-hmm. calm down, and you know, really just like I I wanted to be the one to throw some cold water on that. You know, I I did an article um, in I think it was Fortune um like in maybe 2016 or something like that or 2017 and in the, art, the article they ended up titling it um man who introduced millions to bitcoin says blockchain is a boss you know and the article is basically saying like here's all the things that blockchain are just not a good solution for so stop being so overly excited about it you know and you know when i see the regulators doing it i also sympathize on some level where i'm like they're just trying to like calm people down they've gotten like way over exuberant about something you know like way over top on the potential and use cases and all kinds of stuff what i like when i switch sides is when the regulators then go too far and they start to kill everything whether it's a good idea or not a good idea whether it's a scam or not a scam you know it's like no just be nuanced do your job like look at it and if it's not a scam let them do their thing and maybe it's a stupid idea but they have a right to find that out for themselves, you know? Um, so that's kind of where I come in on a lot of these things. I, but I, I, I think that, um, 
yeah, you have to have a balanced approach. You can't get too swept up in the hype and you can't be too negative about it. And if you just go down the middle you, on over a longer period of time, you usually end up on the right side of history, I would say. That, that's great advice, man. And uh, personally, I've had to learn that because I got burned you know, in the early days entering the market in 2016. And now I know not to, you know, FOMO. I know not to get too hype. I, need, I know, okay, I need to take time and research this and understand it, make sure I'm not taking third party or secondhand information, but I can conceptualize and understand what's happening with, with these projects or tokens or whatever it may be and to do my homework. So that's great advice, man. Um, uh, but on that note, you know, you mentioned the regulators going a little bit too far. I, I think a lot of folks are not happy with the SEC. Obviously, Ripple, a company you worked at, being sued, but we've heard that this could, case could wrap up soon. Uh, I think a lot of folks in the industry are now behind Ripple when years ago they were not, um, because I think folks see that a, a Ripple win would be a win for the crypto industry and many altcoins could maybe be able to use the defenses that Ripple uses. Uh, what what are your thoughts on on how this situation is right now with the lawsuit? Yeah, um, I mean, on on one of the points you made, like you know, people kind of in the crypto industry kind of realizing this affects everybody. That was clear to me from the very first moment that the SEC filed the lawsuit. I was like, this is going to be what determines how a lot of the space is going to be treated in the U.S. Um, so. That's not a surprise. I'm glad people come to that conclusion. Um, I wish they had seen that from the start, but I'm, I'm glad it's happening now. Um, in terms of the case, I mean, look, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not an expert on, you know, predicting which way it's going to go. Um, one of the things I am is somebody who has been in the space for a long time. So one of the things that strikes me about it is that it, it wasn't until... 2017 and you had the big ICO wave and all these things happening um, that the SEC really became interested in this topic, right? And the thing that is so interesting looking back is that like this question of whether XRP is a security would not have even come up before 2016. Like it's just not something anyone thought of as far as I know, right? Um, and I, I did an experiment, like I was searching for on Google, like is XRP a security or something like that as a phrase. And I tried to see if I could find a single hit before 2016. And there was like one or two hits, but they were only like misdated articles from 2018 that like Google had um, missed uh, the metadata on. So um, it literally nobody, not on any online forum, not anywhere, even asked the question, right? And I thought that was very interesting to me because it's like, it's not because of what Ripple did or the XRP community did that the SEC came after XRP. It was because of what other people did in other projects. And that's what ultimately prompted them to go after XRP. Um, and, you know, that just seems a little... That leaves a bit of a bad taste about the whole thing. So that's one one point I would make. Um, but, you know, I don't know. I don't have any Ill, Ill will against the SEC. They're just doing their job. I, I think that in this particular case, obviously, I think they're wrong. Um, I hope they'll lose. Um, and that's pretty much all I have to say on that. Yeah. And I think most folks just want the balance. You know, what you mentioned before is that... Um, <clears throat> Are there scams in the crypto industry? Yes. <laughs> right. I, I don't think we can say 100 percent there's no scam. Are there legit companies in the crypto industry? Of course. Um, do the are, is there lacking crypto regulations? Absolutely. And I think we're seeing members of Congress like Patrick McHenry, Glenn Thompson, uh, Lummis, and Gillibrand, these folks putting out comprehensive regulations to help give that balance. CFTC, SEC, what are your roles? What are the guardrails? What what's you know, what type of new tests maybe needs to be put into place. So I feel that's a, a huge missing part and, and the regulators are going a little bit nuts, but hopefully there's some resolution soon and the United States can be in the driver's seat again for, for this technology. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the things where, you know, I get somewhat emotional about the whole thing is, is having been at Ripple literally from day one and like, you know, I was in the office almost every weekday, many weekends, and 
almost never did I encounter anyone who was in it to get rich quick or as a scam or anything like that. People were genuinely trying to make a better way to pay. Um, and, you know, I will vouch for that to anyone who asks, you know, like, and I was hired as an engineer. Like I wasn't like, you know, obviously I know these people and they're my friends and everything, but I'm, I'm, I'm saying that from the perspective of somebody who was like hired as an employee and like I watched what was going on and from everything I've seen the founders were absolutely genuine and just genuinely wanted to make a great payment system and like Chris has the backstory to 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 back it up like everything he's worked on before around like consumer credit protection and like being able to access your own credit score and everything has always been in the interest of the consumer um and so this like technical argument around like oh is it a security is it not a security um first of all again i'm not a lawyer but if i look at it it's like you're not promised anything when you buy xrp you're not like no one is no one is saying like oh i'm gonna do all this for you right um and that's also what ended up what i think purple's argument boils down to is like you're not that ripple has no obligation to xrp there's like the thing that's used in the network and so if you if you want to buy it just like if you can if you buy diamonds you don't have any claim against the bears if they don't do their marketing well enough or whatever you know like you're just buying diamonds you're just buying this commodity that happens to be traded out there so that's the argument makes a lot of sense to me on a moral level i i think you know it's it's pretty messed up that ripple is a target in this when you have so many other companies that that you know that's what regulators should be going after that's where they should be spending their resources so anyway, but I, you know, I could talk about this forever. I don't think it'd be very interesting to listen to, but you know, no, I, man, I hope the case resolves. It's it's been a travesty, honestly. Yeah, and I certainly appreciate your views, and I think the folks who are going to watch this and listen, they're going to appreciate it too. It's great to get your perspective because, like you said, you were there, you know, heads down, feet on the ground uh, in the early days, seeing all of these things. Um, and like there's there's also so much nonsense that we had to deal with within Ripple because Ripple had this like or Chris and and the leadership had this like focus on trying to do everything by the book and everything with regulators first and with banks and I got so much crap from bitcoiners and like other people in the crypto community for being so in bed with the government and all this you know and so then for it's so ironic that then Ripple is the one that like you know gets in trouble it's just you know, you try to do absolutely everything right, and then regulators still come after you. Like, what's the moral lesson there? Like, what what are what are kids supposed to take away from that? It's like, you know, you're supposed to if you try to do everything by the book, you're supposed to have that as an advantage that at least you know the the powers that be are in your corner. But unfortunately, that wasn't our experience. Yeah, I well, I, I you know, the, in a good way, um, I, I think I'll, it would release of certain documents from the SEC officials like Bill Hinman and so forth, even around the Ethereum situation. I think the SEC is getting a bit exposed that they don't know what they're doing. They're confused and some were doing their own thing and uh, they left the rest of the industry and market in purgatory, uh, aside from Bitcoin and Ethereum for the most part. So I, I think um, some members of Congress are recognizing that and, and they're going to take action, but we'll see how far they go. I, I think I hope they can get this at least something this year before the election cycle next year, but we'll see. Yeah. I mean, like a lot of this has also taught me a lot about how these things work, you know, like politics yeah. parades everything. And so, um, you know, it's, you grow up and you have like a bit more naive view of like how the government works and how, how these things work. And then you kind of experience it firsthand. And so it's, you know, it's nothing now looking back at it, it's like there's nothing that should have surprised me but like i guess i was going at it with a little bit more of a naive world view of like you know the government goes after criminals and if you don't commit crime then you're fine and it's like no that's you know you could also go after big banks and then get in trouble because <laughs> they have a lot of political power so it, yeah. exactly and, and and to your point i i was of the same mindset like a bit naive like uh where i i didn't expect the government to do these things and still to this day i talk about it like i can't believe the sec uh, as a government institution is acting in certain ways and the things judges are saying about the sec i'm like wow it's it's it, it just changed my perception as well it, almost the same way how bitcoin and crypto opened up my understanding of money and finance mm -hmm. much better 
it also has opened the door to see how government operates a bit more. Uh, and, and exactly what you're saying, like you can go by the book with, you know, money talks and, and a lot of times in politics and campaign donations and things like that. And, and maybe on a more positive note, like none of this is inevitable. And I think one of the things you can learn from looking at history is, you know, how well functioning a society is largely depends on the people in that society. Right. And so, we want to live in a world where there's less political backroom dealings and less corruption and less of this and that is just to do less of that and you know be more aware of when it happens and punish the people that that act that way you know and that's how you get rid of it and like you know there have been plenty of examples of societies in in history that have done a better job of that and there are also plenty of examples of of societies that have done a much worse job than than the US has and so um, I think we should be grateful for the level we have and we should strive for a better, better one. Oh yeah, for sure. And, and, you know, the great thing is that we have the constitution and we can at least, um, you know, try to help, help hold folks accountable with, with that. Um, and, and at least with the checks and, and balances, you know, I, I love that these judges reviewing cases and so forth are being very vocal and saying, Hey, this is unlawful. What you're doing is not right. And telling that to a government agency. So, the checks and balances are there. So you're, to your point, um, certainly, you know, our voices and, and the people, we the people can still be heard and, and you know, fight for change. Um, yeah. I mean, that's also something good to remember. It's like you're talking about humans, you're talking about individuals. And like some of these things are quite complex questions, you know, like that span like legal, financial, technical domains and so on. And so, um something that might be totally obvious to me who's worked on this for a long time and at a very deep level um and and i happen to have an interest in both technology and economics and so there's a lot of things that would stump an economist because they don't understand the technology or would stump a technologist because they don't understand the economics like makes sense to me and so you you have a lot of judges and other folks who are like trying to make sense of all this and it's not it's not so easy so i'm glad that that they're taking their time and they're trying to come to the right answer. So, you know, I, I have, I have hope that it all resolved in the right way. For sure. Uh, so Stefan, I got a final question here for you, if you don't mind me asking about it, cause I know you've probably talked. I know what you're going to ask. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, any luck in unlocking the Bitcoin that you have, uh, stuck on that hardware wallet? Um, so I, don't want to give too much away but the process is still ongoing so we're still working on it um there are specific hardware and software teams that i'm working on uh, this with um the main thing which i think would be probably hard to understand for someone who's not experiencing this um is when you're dealing with so much money everything takes forever right like you know before you can you know do some physical attack you first have to like try it lots of times before you do a software attack you first want to like try every angle um and then even just things like the person you're working with while well, you need some contract with them and that contract needs to be rock solid because if there's any issue with the contract you know there's suddenly hundreds of millions of dollars at stake you know mm. um if you're moving something or like physically bringing the device from one place to another you have to have tons of security and all kinds of stuff and so it's like every little thing is just a huge operation and that's why it's taking a long time um so this will probably not be the last time that you and i talk that there will still not be a final outcome on this um but hopefully one day you know it'll either be recovered or it'll be finally lost and i can move on with my life <laughs> I well, honestly, at this point, like after 10 years, I don't care which it is, just, just get it over <laughs> with. Maybe, uh, Stefan, AI could, could assist with this in some way. Yeah. I mean, that's the other thing too. Yeah. So one of the things with, with the wall is like, there's always a trade-off between, uh, risk and how fast you're going to get a result. And like, you can do something fast, but it's more risky or you can take more time and it's less risk. And like, one thing I didn't fully appreciate at the beginning, um, you know, I didn't even think about 10 years ago was if I tried in a, in, a, in a recovery attempt back then, it would have been way less chance of success than it is now. And so the, the more time elapses, the better chances get. And so 
it actually makes a lot of sense to take your time and try to maximize your shot of getting it. So Stefan, I don't know if you have kids or you plan to have kids, but maybe even if let's say you're not able to resolve it now, can you still hand that down to your children and maybe the technology is better in the future to, to, to fix that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that we have everything we need um, today. Oh, excuse me. I, I think we have everything we need today. Um, but, um, you know, if, if we run into some big roadblock and there's a chance that technology will solve it, yeah, absolutely. I'll just put the device away back into the vault and just let it sit there for another. As far as I know, like flash memory doesn't really go bad. Um, so you can let, let it sit as long as it's stored the right way. It, it can stay there for a long time. For sure. Stefan, always a pleasure chatting with you, man. Uh, always learning from, you know, your interviews and every time you speak. So I, I'm so appreciative of you. And, you know, as you continue to work on uh, DAS, DASI, DASI, <laughs> you know, I, I'd love to have you back on and, uh, you know, as give us updates maybe in another few months or whatever it may be. Sounds good. Yeah, I'll definitely do that. And thanks for having me on. So it's a pleasure talking to you and I hope uh, folks enjoy. Thank you.